How does it feel to be recognized as a milestone in Oregon's rich musical history? Well, it's pretty nice. It's uh, it's nice to be included, you know. I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of people in it, I think, you know. So, yeah, we're glad to be included. Up the road. Blending of uh, you guys successfully blended pop, punk, garage, classic rock. It was unsurpassed. Um, maybe name some artists who were the biggest influences on the distraction sound. Uh, well, you know, we grew up in the '60s and stuff. So a lot of the '60s, the soul, R&B stuff, and then the rock and roll stuff uh, that was around then. Every, anything from you know, Link Ray to Beatles, Stones, uh, you Buffalo know, Springfield, Buffalo Beatles. Springfield, yeah. yeah. It's one of the ones that Fred Cole made. And I remember talking to Tootie because you guys were like the coolest looking people I'd seen at that point in time. <laughs> Sam told me a couple weeks ago about his dad first taking him cool. to see Buddy Rich play drums when he was 8, 9, 10 years old. He said it's one day he'll never forget in his life. It changed his life completely. And from that moment on, all he ever wanted to do was play drums. So I was already in Florida with Dave and then Greg drove down there. And then I uh, said, I think we're going to start a new band. It's going to be called Trap or Part because it's still backwards. Right. Anyway, that just ended up being the label, the independent label. And then on our way back, we decided to call it, we stopped in LA at a friend's house and, and he worked at the Lakers Pizza on Sunset Boulevard and uh, he came up with the name The Wipers. And so on our way back to Portland, we said, okay, The Wipers. And we're watching The Wipers go, Wipers. Literally, it was from Winter yeah. Wipers. <laughs> you know what? That's what I always thought. It's an honor. I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. Pete Rogan, you're already a member. Yes, that's true. There, so you're a double member. That's right. right. I was, as, as a member of the Holy Mobile Rounders, which, incidentally, the <laughs> Clamptones were born of the Holy Mobile Rounders. It's actually the same band with a, with a, uh, a, a different lead singer, uh, Jeffrey Frederick and his girlfriend, Jill Gross came out and started, they were friends of uh, guys in the Holy Mobile Rounders, and they came out, started playing some breaks, and uh, it sounded so good, and, and it, it was kind of a revelation to the band that, that uh, geez, we can, we can sound totally different with a, with a different uh, mm -hmm. singer and different, uh, different genre of music, and uh, it really revived the band, and it became a band in its own right. Oh, it's not that much more. Your wife doesn't need you to take her out to breakfast this weekend. Make it at home. <laughs> so 825 on stage, looking for that 850. 825 going once. 825 going twice. Uh, tell me about the early days of playing locally and then the subsequent explosion of popularity and kind of how it grew from there. You want us to start with the biker bars or go straight to the I mean, that is the truth. <laughs> that is the truth. I mean, we, we basically got our start playing Mondays and Tuesdays at a place out on 92nd. Foster. And, yeah, 92nd Woodstock. And, and basically, if you didn't cut it there, you never got a weekend. So then you got a weekend, then the other clubs go, oh, well, maybe these guys are okay, and we'll take them too. <laughs> Electra and what happened? Did that process directly affect the bands breaking up, or 
has been quite clear about that. Absolutely. We worked at it so hard, so long, that when that fell through, it was just kind of like, time to do something else. Yeah. Uh. I don't know. I think he's still kicking around. He might even be here tonight. Um, when the man asked me to step on out and induct him here tonight at the Oregon Music Hall of Fame, it was an absolute honor as well as a little bit of a uh, surrealistic event for me. So I just want to tell you how happy I am right now and in front of you and behind this podium. I'm sporting wood. BA said that was okay. We can. I can't talk about wood on the air, so. You never think about it till it happens for some reason. You know, I, I've been doing it 42 years now, and and uh, I'm honored to have performed all these years and been able to survive all these years, and for your organization to finally recognize me is a real honor. It really is, and it's just the nod of the hat, and it means a lot to me. What was the inspiration that would cause uh, a teenager to build a radio station in his parents' attic? Well, a lot of people might remember that there was a radio station called Kissin' Radio on 10th and Burnside. And I drive by there, and it was stop stoplight once with my brother, and my parents were in the car, and we were listening to the station, and I saw that disc jockey speaking in the mic, and I heard it on the radio, and I said, I've got to do that. And that really was the true inspiration that made me finally do what I did. Well, how'd you learn to do it? I mean, well, I, you know, I built my own radio station, and and uh, my science teacher helped me build it. Okay. He says true. everyone's building these little uh, one watt transmitters. I says I want a ten watt transmitter, and he says I think we can do that. And so I had a more powerful transmitter, even though it only went five blocks. The other transmitters were good for within the house, but I yeah. wanted one that went a little bit further, and and he helped me build it, and that's how we started myself. I, self-taught myself in the uh, attic at my parents' house. It's amazing. I was just guessing science teacher. So, um, <laughs> your parents were very supportive then in a lot of ways. Very supportive, except my father thought I was blowing up the house and <laughs> you know, I was shorting out the electricity. And in those yeah. days, there wasn't uh, breaker boxes. There were fuses. And you had to screw them in and out. And I shut the lights up a few times. <laughs> Crazy Eight, and when I first came here, uh, I played with some of them, like Dennis Shuffler. Yeah. Irene traveled to, then Dennis Shuffler went to New York. Then I was in New York, and I, I traveled with me, and there I wasn't doing anything just to see New York, and I hung out with him. Why says he worried too much? Too much for his own good, but he's too caught in the time to notice him. But I've got a nerve in suburbia. Roll our houses, look the same, look the same, look the same, look the same. We got a nerve in suburbia. small town band from this little state in the Northwest couldn't make it nationally. Therefore, I always believe that if I sat down behind a kit with quality people, yeah. as we have here, that there was no reason why we could not be a success. Let your voices be heard. Don't let your vision be blurred. Raise your fist in the air. Since we that I see It is that anarchy Well, the heart does pull I choose the flight of the dark Cause we gotta have, gotta have, gotta have, gotta have Love and hope Love and hope Love and hope Love and hope Yeah, love Love and hope 
I think that the importance of music education is is beyond what we can talk about right here. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, all the statistics say that that music helps make kids smarter. It helps them in their math scores. It helps them in their communication. It helps them process emotion. And and we want to live in a society that's just about like making little capitalists. I think that's a strange experience, you know. And I think that that the music is basically vital in our yeah. in our community. And and I'm, I'm, I mean that's why I'm here personally. If it wasn't for my experience in bands, and instead my mom was such an intense little hippie that she like <laughs> that she she insisted that I get to be in the in the in the band in school in yeah. second grade rather than sixth grade. Um, my friends at Omaha Fest, if we would come perform, I thought this would be a great opportunity for these guys to be on a, a world-class stage. Yeah. Can't you hear them saying, mm, I'm going home one of these days. I'm going home to my woman, whom I love so dear. But meanwhile, I got to work right. We had been doing playing college campuses, and uh, a lot of those were all age uh, venues. But the, the bar scene had more like top 40 bands. And so the kind of band that we were didn't really fit so well in like a nightclub. Uh, but the tavern scene, once we could have live music, uh, starting in 1974, and we were just lucky to be in the right place at the right time. I'm going home to my woman, ha, whom I love so dear. But meanwhile, I got to work right here. That's the sound of the man. Each time we added a new individual, they brought their own influences into it, and it, our, our music sort of broadened. We never, we never really lost anything that we'd uh, done before. So we were, you know, folk, folk rock, country, country rock, uh, rock and roll, bluegrass, uh, yeah. even some jazz and some other stuff. So that, I think uh, we've often heard from people that said, you know, my uh, my wife and I, or my you know boyfriend and I, uh, you know, we. Uh, um, we could never agree on what bands to go see, but we'd all, always uh, go to see Wheatfield because we knew that somewhere through the night we'd each hear music we liked. Yeah, yeah. That's the sound of the men working on the chain. Yeah. People say that you spread goodwill through your music. How, how so? Well, what I do and what music does, it makes people smile. And I made a New Year's resolution about three or four years ago, four years that in that I would start mentoring kids, teaching them about music history. I just recently signed on at Irvington School doing an artist in residence for 18 weeks, uh, going in Mondays and Thursdays teaching children about music history, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, and also teaching them how to write songs. <laughs> Sylvester 
decide to become the boogie cat and pick up the guitar? 1965, Reed College Commons, I went to hear Buddy Guy play. And I had just started really playing guitar. I knew about five songs, but I was pretty low. I went backstage and told Buddy and met him, and I was lucky enough to go backstage. And I told him, I said, I play guitar. He said, well, really? You play well? I said, well, I play some songs. I told him what songs I played. He said, well, I told his road manager, well, take him out there and let him open up the next set. I said, well, I don't have a guitar. He said, use my guitar. So I'm sweating now. So I go out with Buddy Guy's guitar and play Hideaway and Chicken Chat with his band and warm up for him. And I was hooked after that. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Of the Fat Night, man. Fat Night, it was good. Yeah. I don't know, no, I don't, but I, I don't know, no, I don't. 